Good afternoon. Welcome back to another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. You are tuned in to Intro to Cocktail and Liquor Brand Photography with the man himself, Jordan Hughes. Now, Jordan, I was just telling you before we went live, I thought it would be a great idea to come on to this program half in the bag, but apparently I was the only one that thought me slurring my words to intro you would be a great idea. So good to have you <laughs> on, man. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I mean, I wish there was a way to share cocktails via zoom that technology hasn't you know happened yet because i've got all of the all of the booze in my studio so it's a little ways away from you <laughs> next time next time we'll make it happen uh, we're, we are super excited to have you on i was just telling you, you haven't done anything like this in a while you have some beautiful work i got i got a, a non-alcoholic beverage here that i'm probably going to do some uh practicing on later so going to pick up a tip or nine or 10 or 11 or 12. <laughs> Invite all of you to drink along, watch along and uh, learn along here with Jordan. I'm going to kick it over to you. And uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to get them in, but I'll see you guys in a bit from Q&A. Awesome. Well, yeah. Uh, thank you everybody for, uh, for, for hanging out. Uh, very excited to, uh, yeah, hang out with you um got a few little slides for you as well um yeah kind of a learning experience for for me too just uh a lot of the live streams i've done uh have been more about teaching people how to make cocktails and then more of my photography videography education is usually kind of the pre-recorded stuff uh it's kind of one of those you know perfectionist type so it's fun to do a photography live stream thing of course with, with bnh just super honored to be on this platform and to, to hang out with you all. So brief overview of me and who I am, what I do. So I usually uh, introduce myself as a uh, commercial photographer. It's kind of the, the most succinct way, but generally kind of a cocktail and liquor brand photographer is usually what I say where the majority of my clients are liquor brands, bars, restaurant groups, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be alcohol or booze related for me to do it. I've also done some, some work with like kombucha companies. It's like a tea brand. Uh, generally it just has to be liquid related. Uh, so I do some food photography as well when I'm shooting for bars and restaurants and all of that. But most of it is around cocktails, beverages, uh, you know, bottles. Uh, yeah, that, that sort of thing. So I kind of got into it. Uh, first started in 2017, I was kind of in a career shift trying to reinvent myself a little bit. I was doing some bartending stuff on the side, kind of for some special events, weddings, that sort of thing, but never actually was employed by a bar. I was kind of looking at going that direction, but was like lifestyle wise, it was a little tricky with, you know, it's a lot of late hours and, you know, making drinks is kind of one part, you know, bartending, there's a, a lot more involved and, you know customers you have to deal with and all of that and then I was also doing photography on the side and was looking at doing that and was like at least at the time I thought to do photography full-time I had to do like wedding photography and that meant goodbye weekends goodbye summers all of that so it's kind of like oh here's these two different things I like but wasn't quite a good fit and then I was able to strangely enough combine them and it things just kind of clicked so started sharing a lot of my work on you know, blogs, social media stuff. Um, High Proof Preacher is like a Instagram account I started in a blog that was all about cocktails and spirits and drinks I was making as well as stuff I was shooting for local distilleries and bars and all of that and kind of snowballed from there. Started working with some some bigger liquor brands uh, like Patron, Jack Daniels, some of the, the bigger names out there uh, doing it various things from kind of recipe creation of, you know, coming up with different cocktails that feature these different brands and spirits, as well as, you know, providing the the creative and the, you know, the asset creation for, for different campaigns. So uh, yeah, so it's really kind of snowballed from, from doing a lot of kind of local distilleries and bars into some, some higher end kind of commercial work. So uh, that's kind of the, the long short story. Uh, now I do you know, a variety of things with education where I have my own kind of online educational platform called Cocktail Camera that's linked on the slide there. That's where I provide e-courses, YouTube videos, all this kind of stuff of teaching people beverage photography because as I was getting started, 
a lot of the education I found uh, was around food photography and I was talking with Derek before this where like a lot of food photography, it's, it's, it's very, uh, very, very cool, but, but also very saturated where there's a lot of food photographers, you know, everybody eats, right? So there's a lot of people who are blogging and taking photos of food, but uh, there wasn't a whole lot of education based around taking pictures of drinks or cocktails or beer or wine. So I kind of had to take a lot of the concepts from food photography or even portrait photography and then try to translate it to taking pictures of glassware and, you know, bottles with reflective labels. And there's all these kind of unique challenges that come along with drink photography. So that's where today we're just going to kind of do a little crash course into, you know, cocktail liquor brand photography. Uh, this is my studio here in Portland, Oregon. So I have like a little setup behind me that I will, uh, I'll probably pause my screen share here and, and kind of walk you through some of my stuff here. But I kind of shot a bunch of stuff ahead of time so I can have it in the presentation so you can easily just see it. Uh, but yeah, basically we're gonna kind of walk through how I, you know, took this photo here, uh, just kind of a, a fairly you know straightforward kind of tabletop set. Uh, a, a lot of my work is e either right here in my studio where I kind of have these uh, various backgrounds and kind of little tabletop sets or they're on location. I'm often shooting in bars and restaurants and bringing in lighting and all of that uh, to, to do that sort of thing. So um, that might be another seminar of doing like on location uh, food and drink photography. It's kind of its its own thing. But um, yeah, so with that, uh, you know, I'll kind of at least kind of walk you through my initial setup here. And let me see, I'm going to stop my screen share. Just to, sorry if I'm a little clunky on, on the Zoom here. Um, Let's see. Do you have one question from YouTube that says, what was your camera evolution till now? Uh, maybe that's asking about gear, possibly. Uh, started out with shooting Fujifilm. Um, I am now using uh, the Sony Alpha system. So today I'm using a Sony a7 IV uh, with a 100 millimeter G Master. Um, a lot of lighting is uh, Godox lighting. And um, I have some of this on, on slides here in a minute as well. But started with shooting Fujifilm, kind of jumped into using a, a mirrorless system. Uh, just was like, that was, sounded really cool and exciting to me. So a lot of my pro professional portfolio is shot on Fujifilm. And then I switched over to Sony uh, probably three years ago now, just because I was starting to do more video stuff. Um, and I just really liked some of the, the options that Sony had to offer when it came to producing video. So um, still have a Fuji that I use here and there, but mainly switched over to the Sony. I've been very happy there. So um, yeah, so here's my initial setup here. I'll kind of, you know, adjust my, my little webcam here. I have uh, these photography surfaces. Uh, these are by Ericsson surfaces. There's a kind of wide variety of kind of photography backgrounds and things you can get these days. Uh, Ericsson surfaces are one of my favorites because they're like real wood. Um, oftentimes they have like, this is like a kind of walnut veneer. Uh, this one's like this plaster kind of teal background. Uh, I just love them because there's a lot of really cool wood surfaces. Uh, they all have like real texture. You know, there's some backgrounds that are all like printed on vinyl and all of that. And these just photograph really nicely, as you will see. So I'm shooting uh, basically a, a Manhattan cocktail. So um, I have this just set up uh, here in my studio. I've got my camera mounted on a salon stand. And then um, I have uh, a Godox 80-1200 Pro as my key light. And then I've got uh, another light to light my background, which I'll show you here in a minute. So I'll kind of jump back and forth between kind of my, my slides I have for you and kind of walking you through stuff here in the studio. So... Um, and I do have all of my slides uh, in like a Dropbox for you guys. I shared that in the uh, the Zoom chat, and then I, I think the guys will will post that for wherever you're um, you're you're viewing this, uh, so you have access to the presentation um, afterwards. So, uh, yeah. So um, here's like a few kind of general tips that I 
uh, tend to recommend starting out with drink photography. Uh, some, you know, depending on, you know, your skill level, uh, some might be, you know, some maybe kind of basic for a few of you, but highly recommend using off-camera flash. Uh, I definitely started with just using natural light, relying on big windows uh, as my light source, but especially as I got into doing this for clients, uh, a lot of the clients wanted me to work in bars and restaurants that are, you know, vibey and dark and maybe don't necessarily have windows or I'm shooting at a time of day that doesn't allow for natural light. So off-camera flash just gives you way more versatility. Also, just with flash, uh, you know, a lot of times with drink photography or capturing bartenders, uh, you know, you're you're trying to freeze motion. Uh, even like the the intro image for the session was what I call a zest shot, where it's kind of that finishing thing on like an old fashioned, where you know a bartender takes like the skin of a a lemon or an orange and they just kind of squeeze it over the top of a cocktail, and you just get that that citrus oil uh, landing on the surface. Uh, using flash just allows you to to capture those really kind of small, quick details a lot easier than just using natural light or even like continuous LED light. So always highly recommend using off-camera flash. Um, and as I'll show you today, another big one is light before liquid. Uh, and all of that is just kind of referring to really just having your set dialed in uh, before you pour your drink or, or, you know, set up your cocktail uh, Derek was saying, hey, I've got a non-alcoholic drink. I might practice with this, you know? So generally I'm like, don't even make the cocktail. Don't even make the drink until your your shot, your lighting, your props are set how you want it. Just simply because drinks have a lifespan, especially if they're served with ice. Uh, you know, ice melts. There is certainly fake ice you can get. Uh, you know, there's some of those are, are better than others. Since I do this a lot, I generally am like, I see a shot with fake ice and it, it stands out a lot to me. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't stand out to your everyday person, but I generally actually shoot with real ice uh, just because I'm like, I, I want the real condensation. I want, I want it to be real. Um, I'm not generally faking ice unless I have to. Uh, so that's just a general recommendation is uh, just having everything dialed in. Um, I usually just take an empty glass as we will today as well and have everything set up and test your lighting and test how you're framing everything. And then kind of the last step is pouring and garnishing the drink before you you take the shot. So um, last few things there, uh, more diffusion, exclamation mark. Uh, you know, a big challenge or a common challenge with doing drink photography, and, you know, capturing bottles and glassware things that are reflective or transparent uh, often just comes with, you know, there's reflections and there's highlights and, you know, anytime you're, you know, shooting something that is reflective, you know, it, it needs something to look at, right. Or, you know, if you're flashing light onto a piece of metal or glass, it's going to simply reflect that back. So a common question I get from, you know, like my e-course students or just you know, people on Instagram, are like, how do you, how do you get rid of reflections or how do you, uh, yeah, minimize these harsh highlights? And generally I kind of turn it around and like, you don't want to get rid of them. Uh, I do say like reflections and highlights are, you, are your friends. They can give your subject, your cocktail, your bottle more dimension. Uh, it can, you know, illustrate the the shape and the the, the texture of your subject better, but it's more of a matter of, how to control your highlights, how to control uh, those reflections. So a big part of that is just adding way more diffusion than you think you need. So even my key light back here, um, again, that's a, a 1200 watt light. I can throw on the, the modeling lamp so you can see it a little better, but I have a Octobox on that uh, with the inner baffle. And then I have this big homemade scrim in front of it that I've actually got the scrim, the frame from b &H, and then just some diffusion material that I, I taped on there with white duct tape. Uh, and that's really a, a good way to go when you're, you know, capturing bottles, glassware, just having really diffused light just helps those highlights wrap around like a rounded glass surface or a bottle. Uh, that's just going to make those highlights a lot more pleasing and help shape that light. Uh, so where I'm always just like, when in doubt, just add more diffusion is usually what I recommend uh, when it comes to, to capturing this, this sort of thing. 
Um, and the last one on this slide is, is using uh, map barware. So a lot of the uh, you know props I use in my work, uh, a lot of my work, I'm pretty minimal styling. I try to go for a more editorial look uh, where I'm, I'm generally wanting people to, to feel like they're sitting down at a bar. Someone is making a drink in front of them or serving a drink. Uh, so oftentimes I'm just styling with the barware that would be used for making that specific cocktail. So um, part of that, you know, you have to have some knowledge of cocktails, right? To know like, all right, if you're making an old fashioned, that's a, a stirred drink, you're going to be using a, a mixing glass versus a cocktail shaker. So you, you know, it helps to have some cocktail knowledge around, um, yeah, like how to make certain drinks so that you know what barware you want to incorporate. Uh, so that you aren't using some random piece of barware that you wouldn't even use for that drink because then all the bartenders are going to call you out. Uh, <laughs> so um, with Matt Barware, I just I have several uh, companies I like to go to, have them listed on their Cocktail Kingdom. Bull and China are a couple that have barware and all kinds of different finishes. So I really like these matte finishes where it's still metal, still looks cool, but it's matte. It just photographs a little better. It's not going to you know, you, you don't have to worry as much about highlights and reflections here. Uh, I like this kind of matte, kind of aged copper look. There's like a strainer, it's got like a little jigger that that matches this. Uh, so usually recommend with kind of when it comes to finding barware that you want to use in your photos as props, trying to find some that are uh, matte finishes because there's there's been a few shots. I have a few. Um, I put out a my first cocktail book last year. Uh, and it, there's several shots in there that I ended up just including it because it's kind of funny where you know, you can see my reflection in the shaker or in the jigger where it's me, you know, with my camera on the tripod sort of thing. And, you know, if you really look, you can get like this little picture of me in, in the photo. So um, that's just like easy kind of recommendation. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't want to be too self-promotional here, but if you do want to learn more about kind of cocktails and all that, I do have my own cocktail book out called twist so uh, a lot of cocktail recipes and also just like basics around understanding cocktails thought process techniques behind making them um that will at least kind of cover the basics for you and it's not like a super intense read you know there's there's like one chapter in the beginning that kind of covers all the basics and, and all of that so that's a resource uh for you if you want so um, let me check the chat here really quick, just to make sure. Um, let's see. Uh, is it possible to shoot with constant light instead of flash? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, for me, it's more like just, I, I think off camera flash just is more effective. It gives you more versatility and, you know, allows you to freeze motion really easily. Uh, and it's, it's also, I like being able to not have cords and all that, especially if I'm shooting in a bar or restaurant. Um, I prefer to, you know, just have something that's on a battery pack that I can kind of run and gun more easily. But yes, you can sure, certainly shoot with continuous lighting. Uh, use what you have, uh, but recommend kind of, you know, picking up even just a speed light uh, and messing around with some off-camera flash stuff. Uh, I do think it just gives you a lot more control uh, just especially when capturing glassware. So, uh, yeah, so um, I'm going to keep going here. So here's, uh, again, this whole presentation, you can download and have these slides for later, but here's kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of setting up the lights here early earlier on. Again, I have two Ericsson surfaces. Uh, you know, one's a, a wood background, one's like this plaster background. I, and this is just with my um, my key light on. So I've got that big scrim to soften the light. I uh, have my exposure settings there on the bottom for you. Um, and honestly, I like this, but it's a, it's a bit glowy. Uh, you know, so you've got, you know, the, the background is, you know, I'd like to see a richer color, some more contrast there. So um, if you can kind of see... Uh, I mean, I can, can show you literally behind me, but I can go to this next shot here where I just kind of slipped some black poster board uh, to the side of my scrim here. So it's it's really a little precarious. It's just kind of wedged between my scrim and the background. The background I have just, 
um, you know, I have a ski stand kind of locked onto it, holding it up. And I just have it kind of wedged in the corner there. Now, as you can see, that just gives us, you know, a little bit, you know, obviously a, a much moodier look. There's kind of this shadowed gradient in the background. Uh, this is at least, you know, a step in the right direction for what I'm envisioning. I, I generally kind of prefer this moodier kind of one kind of directional light with a little more intense shadows. Um, that's just generally more of kind of the, you know, an evening kind of cocktail bar vibe. Uh, so again, this is like same exposure settings, same, uh, you know, lighting is the same power level. It's just kind of sliding those, uh, those black poster board in, uh, just kind of blocking off, flagging off some of the light just to make it not quite as bright and as tense on the background there. Um, so... Uh, sorry to kind of go back and forth there. I'm just trying to keep an eye on the, on the chat as well, but, uh, let's see a few questions. Uh, what modifiers should we use size and shape? Uh, I'm using an Octobox here. Uh, my scrim is obviously this big square. Uh, generally I do like using square modifiers. Uh, strip boxes I use a lot often because you're shooting bottles, glassware, things that, that are taller. Uh, so having modifiers that are more linear, you know, just your highlights will, will be more linear and tend to be a little easier to work with. Um, since I'm using a big scrim here, it doesn't really matter as much the shape of my modifier. Um, but generally I, I do kind of go with more rectangle or, or strip boxes. Um, is it important to immediately have a macro lens and uh, I would say maybe not immediately. That is generally what I use. I do prefer to, to shoot more at the kind of 90 to 100 millimeters when shooting drink photography stuff, just because, you know, most of my subjects are, you know, they're, they're small, they're on a tabletop. Uh, so, you know, generally, I'm, you know, if you even shooting at a, a, a 50 millimeter, you're going to get probably some distortion a little bit. So I prefer to, to have something more at 90 to 100. And, and macro certainly does help just with capturing those small details. But you don't necessarily have to starting out. But long term, that's probably a good uh, direction to go in. Uh, let's see, are f1.4 and 1.8 lenses better for this type of photography, not only for close-ups, but for creamy backgrounds? Or, you do, uh, or do you want uh, sharpness overall. So generally, I'm actually not closing my lenses uh, or opening my lenses up that far. Uh, I mean, with a lot of this stuff, especially with shooting at a 90 millimeters or 100 millimeters, um, you have a lot of compression already. So uh, I'm shooting at like f8 uh, on this, I think, for these shots. I'm generally shooting at like f8 to f11 because, again, I'm also using off-camera flash. So I have a lot of light to compensate for, for closing down my aperture. So personally, I, I would say no, like getting a really fast lens with a really, you know, 1.4 aperture isn't necessarily essential. It does help if you're shooting in dark bars and you maybe can't use your flash. Sometimes that's the case if I'm shooting in a bar where, you know, they're open or they're you know, serving people and I don't want to ruin the vibe with the flash. Sometimes I just got to just, you know, open up that aperture, crank that ISO and, you know, <laughs> make it work. But generally I'm shooting in bars and restaurants, you know, before they open or it's, it's scheduled where they aren't serving people. So generally you don't have to worry too much about having a, a super fast aperture, especially if you're using flash. So uh, do you bring the same gear with you to on-site shoots? That's a great question. Uh, I'll answer that one and then I'll, I'll jump back into kind of the, the shoot here. Uh, but yeah, that's a great question. It depends on the shoot. Usually, you know, here in studio, you know, I've got my, my 1200s, you know, they've got power boxes and stuff, that sort of thing. I, I usually am leaving in studio. I'm not bringing my big salon stand, of course. Uh, so normally I do kind of have a slightly more mobile equipment that I will roll with. Um, I have a couple 600 watt uh, strobes that I bring with me, uh, some spreader stands versus C stand, uh, some, you know, lighting modifiers that just, uh, you know, kind of pack up a little smaller. So 
generally I, I do try to roll with stuff that's just a little more lightweight compared to, you know, packing a bunch of scrims and, and backgrounds with me. So, um, yeah, so I kind of have my studio set up and then I have, you know, the, the run and gun set up for, for taking stuff to, to bars. Uh, so also depends if I have an assistant, you can kind of help me carry stuff and set stuff up. I also have like a, a one bag set up where I have just speed lights. So just small lights with umbrellas for when I'm shooting just myself. So definitely have some various options depending on, you know, the shoot and, and what I'm doing. So um, a few more great questions coming in uh, and I'll, I'll do my best to, to get to all of them, but also want to uh, just kind of keep going here as well, just so we can keep moving. Um, let's see, I'll make sure that's going here. Uh, here's kind of continuing on with this uh, shoot here. I'm adding in a second light uh, just to, to kind of add some dimension, some interest to my background. I always like like putting some sort of light on my background in a studio shoot like this. Um, I am using a, uh, I think this also was a BNH purchase. So perfect. Uh, it's the Westcott Optical Spot uh, by Lindsay Adler. So you kind of move my camera here. You can kind of see it. Uh, sorry, it's kind of silly there. Yeah, kind of up high there on a 600 watt strobe. Um, so that's like a little spotlight for a strobe where you could kind of put these little metal gobos in there. So for this shoot, I'm you know using this kind of window blind gobo just to kind of add some, some more texture to the background. Uh, and you can see in these photos, you know, that's just with the background uh, light on. So you can kind of see what that's doing. And then it, here's kind of with both key light and background light. Um, and just as I'm kind of messing with my shot here. So uh, again, like I said, like I generally try to keep things fairly simple when it comes to props. I'm not a huge, um, yeah, not a super talented stylist. Uh, if it's a very big commercial shoot for a brand, I'll often hire a, a stylist who I enjoy working with just because I'm like, cool, like I don't even have to worry about it. So this is kind of my own kind of simple styling where generally incorporating different pieces of uh, barware, glassware. Um, hopefully you can kind of see in the corner here, I have various just kind of unbranded bottles that have whiskey in them or gin. I usually just get like the very, a very cheap spirit if I'm just using it for props, but I'll often incorporate if it's a whiskey cocktail, I'll put like an unbranded whiskey bottle in it just because you know unless i'm getting paid by a brand i don't want to include that stuff in there so i just kind of have collected a few kind of nice looking unbranded glass bottles so another tip for you there um and then as you can see you know in, in this photo in the corner i have kind of this this dark thing which i guess is kind of hard to, to see in that image but that's another piece of barware this is a jigger so used for measuring ingredients in cocktails so uh, that's kind of have like right in the foreground, just kind of looking past the jigger. Often like just kind of including a few various things in the foreground. Again, kind of makes the viewer feel like they're they're just kind of looking in at a cocktail being made or being served. So uh, this is usually just a bit of a process. Again, kind of lighting before liquid, propping before liquid, where I'm, I'm messing around with, okay, I, I put a, a whiskey bottle into the side, but it looks photographing really dark it's not catching the light very well so I swap that out for a mixing glass which is the vessel you would typically make a Manhattan inside of and that I did put fake ice in just because I'm like that's going to be just sitting in the background anyway kind of slightly blurred out with a depth of field um, again this is shot at f8 on a hundred millimeter lens so you know you get some good compression and you know depth of field even at f8 uh, so I just kind of, you know, mess with moving that a little closer, a little further back, um, add a bar spoon in the background too. And, you know, there's always kind of a tricky balance with shots like this where, you know, you don't want things to feel cluttered. You know, even with the bar spoon there, I'm like, ah, it's, I, I, I like it, but I could see why how some people would be like, ah, it's maybe a little too much, a little distracting. It's always like a little bit of a balance of like, I want to try and frame my subject. Obviously I want the drink, the cocktail to be the hero here. Uh, but, you know, so that, that's always a balance and kind of up to you of, of like, you don't want to 
overcrowd it, but I still like including some of these elements just to add some some interest. So um, here's a little trick for you guys, <laughs> something I, I do often with, uh, well, not too often. Like I said, I, I don't use a lot of fake ice unless I absolutely have to. I generally am using like an inexpensive spirit that I'm just kind of, you know, camera can't tell if this is fancy whiskey or not, right? So, uh, but something I also do as well, if, if buying a whiskey isn't an option or you don't want to, you know, spend your money that way, totally get it. Uh, you can use soy sauce to mimic whiskey or a whiskey cocktail. So I am taking just some water here and you can really just add, I mean, I mean, that may have been a little much, just like a little bit of soy sauce to the water. So you're really just di over diluting soy sauce and that will more or less kind of mimic the, I can kind of stir it up here, but uh, there we go. <laughs> I don't want to stir with my finger. I've done that too, but uh, more or less mimic the appearance of whiskey or of a whiskey cocktail. Uh, generally a cocktail will, will be a little darker, so you might add a little more soy sauce. You don't wanna overdo it, but that's generally kind of the look I'm going for. And as you can see, as it catches the light there, it does a pretty good job mimicking the appearance of it. So um, that's where, you know, I have the, everything kind of set up already here. And I'll just kind of pour that into our, our glass and honestly like it it looks pretty convincing uh one recommendation i guess is you know since this is basically a still life shot for this one um using the soy sauce is works great uh one piece of advice i guess if you're if you're capturing something in motion so you're you're shooting a bartender or someone pouring whiskey into a glass, uh, there, there will be a difference in viscosity of, you know, water with soy sauce versus whiskey. And it is a very subtle detail. Um, it's one of those things where I'm like, maybe your average person might not notice it, but you know, if you're photographing and freezing a, a stream of liquid, it is going to look different in motion, uh, whether it's a spirit or water. So I will use this if I'm just, you know, shooting a stationary finished cocktail, but if, I need to capture any process shots. Generally, I'm like recommend use the real thing, even if it's a cheap version of it. That's a, a better way to go. So, um, and sorry, I know there's a lot of questions coming in. Definitely want to to get to them here. Uh, but also want to make sure we we finish out this uh, this shot here. Uh, oops, sorry. So I will do my best to uh, to get to them when I can. Uh, yeah, so there's our, you know, adding liquid again looks pretty convincing. Even in motion here, it actually looks looks pretty close. So, um, yeah, so here's kind of the the final image where you know just adding a garnish and there's kind of a lot of different things I'm I'm kind of zipping through here fairly quick. This is kind of why I have whole e courses about this stuff. Uh, but there's a level of, um, you know cocktail garnishes it's like a whole other thing as well so um i like just taking you know fairly simple garnishes little citrus peel uh trimming the edges off of them um and you know this, this is something we kind of i do a few tutorials about as well just kind of like making sure the garnish makes sense for the drink you're capturing and also making sure that it you know doesn't draw too much attention <laughs> away from the drink some drinks like a Bloody Mary, you know, they're meant to be over the top. They tend to have just really insane garnishes, right? <laughs> like I've seen Bloody Marys that have like a whole, you know, fried chicken on them. So generally I keep it pretty simple. I'm shooting a lot of classic cocktails. Again, Manhattan, I'm just using like a citrus twist, maraschino cherry. Um, I usually just like doing, you know, these, these simple twists with maybe a slit in it, putting it on the rim of the glass. Uh, but this is really kind of the, the final image I, I got here with um, just some, some light editing here. We didn't really do a whole lot. This is mostly in camera. I uh, just kind of did some basic edits in Lightroom. Um, and then next to it, of course, you can see the kind of how the shot is, is laid out. 
but that's generally how I how I approach this shot again with kind of tabletop photography like this. Um, it's you can you can do a lot in a small space, uh, which is is nice. Where it's like you don't necessarily need a huge studio. You can do it at home in your kitchen. Obviously, it gets a little crazy with bringing lights around and all of that. But uh, starting out, this very much was like stuff I was shooting in my dining room or a living room and resetting my wife and I's apartment for for brand shoots was a little crazy. So it's definitely it's nice now to have a proper space to to do all this. But um, that's at least kind of the the end result went for here. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to make sure. I'm getting to all these questions here. So thank you all for, for kind of sticking with me as I'm trying to uh, jump back and forth. So um, do you treat your glassware with fake condensation such as glycerin mix? Uh, yes, uh, occasionally, not all the time. Um, usually for like the big commercial shoots. Um, and typically that's something I, I kind of leave to my stylist. Um, oftentimes with bottles, like we we have to kind of prep the bottles ahead of time where there's usually like some sort of kind of clear coat thing. I'm kind of blanking on exactly what it is. Cause again, the, typically the stylist will, will do it for me, but kind of a clear coat on the bottle to kind of protect the label and then do, yeah, like this kind of glycerin water mix, uh, which, you know, for, for those of you who haven't tried that, like glycerin will will give like this great condensation look and it will just sit there forever versus just like spraying it with water. It'll eventually kind of drip down. Um, but doing kind of this water glycerin mix, it's like, it just hangs out on the bottle for forever. Great. Um, so that is something we'll do on kind of the bigger commercial shoots, but not kind of every day for me, at least. Uh, let's see. Do you shoot with a large monitor connected to your camera or just check the back LCD? Uh, yes and no. Um, yeah, like sometimes like, like for me, like I'm doing a lot of client work, uh, in the studio. I'm also doing a lot of work for, you know, social media content. Uh, it kind of depends on the, the shoot or the type of job. Uh, sometimes I'm just like, oh, I'm just moving quick. Uh, I just want to be, you know, connected to the camera sort of thing. I, I won't really bother about uh, setting up a monitor, but yeah, having a monitor or shooting tethered to, to capture one, um, it certainly helps a lot, especially with kind of a, a shoot like this, where it is very precise, uh, you know, if I'm shooting in a bar or restaurant, I'm generally just, you know, looking at the back of my camera in studio and, you know, and stuff are very precise and it's all about kind of, if the bottle is, you know, one inch back or one inch forward, it, it does help having a, a larger monitor shooting tethered to be able to, to see those things better for sure. So um, how fast do you normally shoot action shots? Uh, honestly, this is part of the, the flash thing. Um, I mean, when you're using flash, you know, your, your shutter speed honestly doesn't matter as much because oftentimes I'm shooting flash indoors. So a lot of the ambient lights, I, I tend to just crush out. I expose out the ambient light a lot of the times because oftentimes in bars or restaurants, it's like there isn't much ambient light anyway. So then the only light that I'm working with is light from my flash. So, I mean, I've shot some incredibly crisp action shots that like one over 60. Uh, it doesn't have to be very fast. There is like your, your sync speed, right? So one over 250 is like generally your sync speed on most cameras. Um, you can do high speed sync on certain flashes, but you don't need that to freeze motion. If you're crushing out your ambient light, or excuse me, if you're, if you're exposing out your ambient light, uh, your, your flash essentially becomes your, your shutter and it's very fast. Um, so there are some factors on, you know, some flashes have a different flash duration, but, um, basically your shutter speed ends up becoming like the dial of like how much ambient light you want in the image. So um, it's not as big of a factor when it comes to freezing motion. Generally, I'll just set it at one over 250 because that's the sync speed. Uh, if I want to have a little light from the back bar, for example, you know, bring in some of the ambient light, I might you know, slow down my shutter speed. So again, it, it lets in more ambient light, but my shutter is, or my, my flash is essentially gonna be my shutter and it will still be able to freeze motion. So, um, Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, 
Again, I have some tutorials that dive a little deeper into that. A lot of my tutorials are around Flash and how to use Flash in weird environments like bars and restaurants. <laughs> so um, there's certainly a lot to, to talk about there and I love it. Definitely a big lighting there. Um, all right, a few more questions here. Honestly, love these questions, everybody. Like um, there's certainly more I, I could jump into and talk about, but really enjoying everyone's questions as well. So um, how would you suggest uh, to go about think times uh, for off-camera flash for capture motion uh yeah so similar to what we talked about um yeah like sync speed 250 but but yeah like a simple way of thinking about it is is your your shutter is is your dial for how much ambient light you want in your exposure uh and then your your off-camera flash becomes your flash essentially so um yeah so hopefully that that answered that a little bit already uh, and then do you composite bottle images? Any tips for putting composites together to make a clean glow? Okay, I actually have a YouTube video specifically about this. So if you go to, you know, the Cocktail Camera YouTube channel, um, I have, a, I think it's called How to Make Your Whiskey Bottles Glow or something like that. But yeah, it's all about kind of simple compositing where I composite like, I think I just did two to three images um, using some gold foil to make the bottles glow. Uh, you know, one of the images uh, I was showing you guys where I was, I was trying to put this in the background and, you know, it kind of photographed really dark. I wasn't getting any of this kind of nice color. Uh, oftentimes with including bottles uh, or especially when you're shooting for a brand, you know, you don't want to have a, a dark looking whiskey bottle. You know, you want it to look inviting and to have that amber glow. So usually the best way to do that is through compositing. So taking multiple exposures exposing for exposing for the label then exposing for you know the the bottle and getting like a glow in there with a gold card and then you know compositing those together in photoshop and it's not nearly as complicated as it might sound initially so again i have a whole youtube video hope you guys check it out cocktail camera on youtube it's one of the, the top tutorials on there so um yeah but definitely use compositing uh, especially for for, for brand photography and all of that. So um, next one is how to get such clean glasses. Is it something you take care of pre-shoot or while editing? Is there any specific tools you use to clean your glasses? Uh, yes, let me grab one here. So definitely a pre-shoot situation. Um, you know, having gloves is also helpful. Uh, what I've found to be the best, I just keep several of these, um, yeah, you know, I have several unopened ones. Uh, Riedel, which is a glassware company, they make uh, just little polishing cloths. I think it's just the Riedel microfiber polishing cloth. Yeah, so it's microfiber. I've used a variety of microfiber cloths, but these ones, I mean, it's made by a wine glass company, are just, I don't know what magic they put in them. They just work flawlessly. Like I just throw a little water on my glassware and use these to dry them. Don't need soap or anything. I mean, if you have like really tough stains or whatever, you might want to soap and sponge. But generally, I just splash some water on, dry with one of these, and my glassware is like below. It's crazy. Uh, definitely swear by these. So Riedel microfiber cloth. Um, I get them like on Amazon in packs of two. Uh, definitely just having a ton of those on hand uh, for for beverage sheets for sure. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, and then of course, you know, there's you can do some retouching uh, with with glassware as well. I just always try to have everything as as clean and nice as possible, just to minimize. You know, I don't I don't want to sit on Photoshop all day, kind of clicking off pieces of desk. But <laughs> definitely a good question. Um, let's see. Do you tether your camera to your laptop, and what software do you use for editing? Thanks so much. Um, hi, Donna. Uh, yeah, so. I will, uh, I'm still kind of in between Lightroom and Capture One. Uh, with shooting Sony, uh, I usually tether to Capture One. Uh, honestly, I'm really Im impressed by what I've tried with Capture One. I just haven't fully like moved over there because I've been using Adobe Lightroom for years and years. Still really like Lightroom and, and a lot of the advancements with you know easy masking and everything they've added recently. Uh, still a big fan of that. Uh, but also I'm like really enjoying Capture One and kind of between those two for tethering, definitely Capture One just has a, a especially with the Sony system, 
really great way of, of doing doing things. So um, that's usually what I use uh, for for editing and, and tethering and all of that. So um, let's see. I think I got through most of those. Um, going through a few more here. Uh, I've been a food photographer in India. I wish to understand the business side in the United States. Do you do coaching in this segment? Um, yeah, so I mean, the business side is, you know, obviously another huge side of it. Um, a lot of my e-courses are more focused on the technique side of things. Um, but that's honestly one of the, the biggest questions I get from my students all over the world is trying to understand the business side, the what to charge, how to approach clients. So we don't really have enough time today to, to, to dive super deep into that, uh, but that's definitely something I'm, I'm working on offering uh, more of, because uh, that's, that's definitely been something that's been a headache for myself as well, of, of kind of getting into this industry as a lot of kind of figuring stuff out on my own and um, also haven't found a whole lot of, of great resources for people starting out. So. Um, I haven't necessarily offered one-on-one -on -one coaching with that just yet, but definitely have some resources on the way that will we'll focus more on the, the nitty gritty kind of business side. Um, did want to mention some, some at least stuff with, uh, with this session of kind of some basic best practices for working with beverage clients. So for me, it, it does kind of feel like two, almost like two different businesses. Uh, as far as, you know, my clients tend to be liquor brands as I mentioned, and they also tend to be, uh, you know, bars and restaurants. That's kind of like these two big groups or like, you know, ho hotel groups, hospitality groups. And it does kind of feel like two different types of businesses because generally, um, you know, there, there's some big factors where based on what market you're based in or what market you work in. Um, I'm in Portland, Oregon, West Coast. It's a little bit of a smaller market compared to something like LA or even Seattle, you know? So, um, tends to be a smaller market, a lot of independent restaurants, very cool happening bar restaurant scene, but a lot of independently owned places that don't have huge budgets. But I personally just really enjoy working with bars and restaurants. So for me, like I have the most fun and get the most energized doing bar and restaurant work, but the stuff that really pays the bills tends to be the commercial stuff for the brands, uh, the liquor brands who, who have you know, the big marketing budgets to do bigger projects, to pay for image licensing, all of that. So I do kind of approach those two different types of clients differently. I have like two different intake forms on my website. I also have these on my, my blog on Cocktail Camera where it's like, you can copy my intake form. I've got a form like if you're a bar or restaurant, fill out this form, tell me, you know, stuff of like dates, what sort of images you want, uh, what your budget you're working with that kind of thing to kind of vet the client. And then I have another form for brands to kind of go through what sort of uh, image licensing you need. Are you gonna be using these for ads? Is it gonna be social media content? Kind of getting all the details I can right up front. Uh, so I, I do just kind of approach those two different sides of the business a little differently, just cause I could just be like, ah, I'm just commercial. I'm just gonna work with the brands cause they have the real money. But I don't seem like, I just have so much fun shooting the bars and restaurants and it does pay. It's just not as much as some of the, the, the bigger budgets, but um, that kind of keeps me sharp as a photographer doing the more kind of independent restaurant work. Uh, Cause it's, you know, bar restaurant owners, like we trust you. We like what you do, have fun with it. So I can kind of be really creative and, you know, just, get to kind of define this brand for them versus working with a liquor brand where it's, there's a brief, there's a style guide, a mood board. You're often working with the art director. It's a little more cut and dry. Uh, so again, that's kind of the two sides, kind of the uh, basic overview of how I approach clients. And um, yeah, hopefully that, that gives you some info. Uh, but again, there's you know lots we could get into on the, the business side of things. So uh, let's see, Casey. Hey, I was at your book signing last year at Amser. No way. Uh, if a bar doesn't have interesting glassware, do you offer to bring your own or shoot with what's on hand? Uh, good question. I, I generally just, you know, if I'm shooting for a bar restaurant, it's, it's up to them where I'm like, it's your glassware, it's your ingredients, it's your ice. Um, if, a, if a bar restaurant asks like, hey, like, 
we've seen some some cool glassware in your shoots or you know if they're they're asking for me to bring stuff um i might i might do that uh there'd probably be some sort of fee involved with that just of like the risk of bringing something of my own that is highly fragile and breakable to a shoot um similar to like you know if you're doing a commercial job you might have a fee for you know gear rental even if it's your own gear you know it's kind of this like fee of like acknowledging yeah like i'm using my stuff <laughs> and charging for it in case something happens uh and you know some photographers kind of go back and forth on, on on doing that or not but definitely if i'm bringing glassware or even bringing backgrounds like these ericsson surfaces um it's stuff that i've paid for and invested in and it could likely get damaged or broken in on location shoots so if i was to do that i would i would likely kind of add that to my estimate uh but yeah good question um, do you find a particular type of brand of diffusion works, uh, works best other than softbox? Uh, I've had issues with stars in some when I'm lighting. So not necessarily specific brands, but yeah, I mean, I think I, I don't know if I have my exact links for you guys, but I got all the stuff for my scrims on, on B and H, uh, got like these metal frames, I have various sizes. And then I think it's lee diffusion material like you, there's different diffusion material that are like different stops of diffusion so different kind of thickness levels um i think this is just like one stop or one and a half stop of diffusion um but not necessarily married to a specific brand kind of whatever works for your budget um yeah there's also you know more kind of mobile friendly scrims you can get as well that kind of pack down and fold up but um not too specific there so uh yeah i think we got to all those um yeah so many good questions i'm seriously really thrilled about this so uh just a few things for you guys um i do have uh you know my drink photography e-course called cocktail camera pro i uh, just wanted to throw this out there for you for anyone who's interested in, in going a little deeper learning about drink photography um do you have a 30 percent off code for you if you want to jump in the course is all like pre-recorded stuff it's on demand lessons so you know you can enroll and then access it anytime you want um, and it's lifetime access it's not like you know you only get it from this month to another month you enroll pay for it and you, you just have it forever um so bh photo that's the code for 30 percent off valid until kind of end of this month uh, for any of you who who might want to jump in, learn more. Um, so I, I don't want to just like hound you with promotional stuff, but also just launching a vertical video course as well. Um, a lot of my students have been like, we're photographers, but social media is so focused on video right now. So putting out a new course that is, oh, I guess I never played that, but putting out a new course that is um, very much focused for photographers people who kind of have a photography background or whether it's professional or enthusiast to kind of learn how to, how to use vertical video on social media, whether that's just doing social media content or offering kind of vertical video services to clients. Um, just cause that's been a, a regular ask from a lot of my members. So um, that's like on pre-sale right now ends in a couple of days. So I thought I'd, I'd offer that to you guys as well. Um, I don't know if there's, Oh, there's the link. Yeah. So cocktailcamera.com slash vertical video. Uh, if you want to check that out. And then, um, you know, if you want the, to join the photography course as well. So um, again, like I'm you know, love going through questions here. I'll probably go through a few more, but um, if we sign off today and I didn't get to any of your questions. Uh, hit me up on Instagram. I am on the cocktail camera account pretty much every day, uh, love just like nerding out with people, whether that's answering questions or, um, yeah, like oftentimes people are just like, want to know what, what gear to get or, <laughs> you know, what, what lighting to look at when you're starting out, always happy to, to help you guys out with those sort of questions and stuff. So, um, definitely don't be a stranger. Always feel free to hit me up in the DMS or, or whatever. My email's on there as well. So always happy to, to nerd out with you about camera stuff and, and all of that. So um, yeah, I know there's a couple more questions, I think. And looks like we have uh, some links as well. Uh, thanks for sharing those, Derek, of, um, to the course and to some various resources. But 
um, yeah, we, we like covered a lot. I feel like I just kind of here, here's all this stuff for you, but hopefully you it was, it. uh, helpful. <laughs> You're a rock star, man. I'm sitting here. I'm like, I don't need, I don't even have to do anything. I'm like, he's handling he's got the Q and a down. I'm like, I'm just going to stay out of his way. He's rolling. <laughs> awesome. Well, look, I no, yeah. I, let's see if there's any, any linger. And I think you, thank you pretty much got yeah. everything. Let's see. All right. Look at that. You're even reposting people, getting shout outs for the yeah. repost there. <laughs> awesome. I, I'm yeah. going to throw a question. In. I don't think, I know you covered the whole fake ice versus real ice thing, but I know I've heard this yeah, yeah. discussed and I'm not, I'm the first, this thing from a cocktail photographer, but does the shape of the ice matter? Um, I mean, not really. I mean, it, it's tricky because a lot of the ice that I use, I could probably a piece from my freezer here so um being like the the nerd that i am i actually have like an ice supplier <laughs> uh so i have there's a company here and in a lot of markets there's different companies that that provide cocktail ice so this is like a a clear sphere they have all these different um i've got like the big cubes they they sometimes they'll do custom stuff for me where I'm like, oh, it's springtime. Can I get a clear sphere with like a flower in the middle? And they'll be like, two days later, they'll have a bag full of them for me. Um, so, I mean, when it comes to shape, it, it probably doesn't matter a ton. There is a certain level though, like even when I'm shooting with real ice, sometimes people look at that and go like, that can't be real. Uh, just because not everyone has like a, a clear sphere in their freezer, you know? So yeah. Uh, Sometimes there there is a, a time where I'm like, okay, like even with using real ice, having something that's too perfect sometimes doesn't translate well. So, um, yeah, so it's it's one of those things you kind of like. Uh, there's a weird balance to it, but generally, it's like shape doesn't matter a a ton. You know, spheres just kind of get the oohs and ahs. You know, even the big cubes, people are just like, oh, there's something about like a giant chunk of ice that makes people go like oh that's cool you know <laughs> so <laughs> it works uh, i know i know when i get yeah. a drink and it has one of those i'm like oh, yeah, I have yeah. no problem paying 18 dollars for this drink because the ice right. is no it's it's definitely more of an aesthetics thing i feel yeah. like but as i mentioned with this like this is like a, a background thing where this does have fake cubes uh and these are like if, if they were front and center I just feel like they look more plastic. It's hard to see on the the webcam, but um, maybe if there's liquid in them, maybe not, you could get away with it. There's just kind of a big quality difference with fake ice. Uh, there's like the, I think it's called Trend Grove ice. That's like the really high end stuff that you can get at prop stores. But those run like a few hundred dollars a cube sort of thing. Like they're just really like the super high end. So probably don't have to go that level. These are like more kind of bottom, you know, probably, you know, Amazon purchased. There's got to be some in the middle. I just haven't found yet, but yeah. Mm -hmm. are, are you worrying about temperature control? I know there's, there's times when I used to have a really hot key light that I would use to stream. And by the end of a one hour stream, I'm like sweating. My shirt is wet. It's like the LEDs make it a little better. I know you use strobes yeah. primarily. So you don't have light just constantly baking the drinks, but do you worry about temperature control sure. at all? Not generally. Uh, yeah. Especially with strobes. It's like, it's not, it's not a whole lot of heat on them. Um, yeah, definitely. Like it depends on, on where you shoot. Like, you know, there, there's some bars where I'm like, Oh, we got to be moving, moving quick. Uh, <laughs> you know, just, just to get stuff before the drink starts getting all sweaty looking. Um, generally though, like in my studio, especially like I can kind of, Keep it running pretty cool and uh, it's generally not a huge issue for me so yeah awesome well jordan i can't thank you enough man this was everything you had promised and more super <laughs> energy i always love when i can just sit back and i don't have to do work and i can actually learn oh sweet it's even oh, better. Bad. just make it easy for you you know exactly yeah if you want to come on just every day at one and three <laughs> we'll, perfect we'll schedule yeah. it out now we, we'd definitely love to have you back for sure so a huge thank you to you and uh, to everybody else out there, I'm going to sneak in one last question because it's yeah. interesting to me. Hot drinks, whipped cream, it's winter. We got hot chocolate going around. Oh, yeah. Does that change the game? Do you do anything like that or is it clear drinks or? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't do it as as often. Um, yeah, I feel like with that, it's it's more a, the game of like communicating 
the temperature. Uh, so it's, it ends up more being about like, how can you capture like the steam and the, you know, so, um, so that definitely can get tricky. Uh, sometimes that's, you end up having to rely a little more on the, the Photoshop magic and doing some, some overlay stuff to, to properly get it to, to, to read hot, you know? Um, so yeah, so it's, it's not like one I, I do a, a ton with, but that's generally like a, um, yeah, a, a little trickier to, to do in studio. Cause it's like, if you're, if you're using like a really kind of dark background and you can kind of backlight your drink. Uh, that helps with kind of showing off that steam. Um, but that's also something that dissipates really quickly too. So um, that's something where, you know, if, especially if you're doing it for a client, it's more like kind of worth getting a good editor who can make, you can, you can really make that steam, add that in or make that really look realistic because that is an especially tricky one. But now I'm thinking like, okay, I should probably do a YouTube tutorial on capturing like steam and smoke and stuff. That would probably be fun. So there we go. Smoky, now, now I'm thinking <laughs> you got time to practice that smoky old fashioned. I'm going to get when you make it out yeah, to New York. Totally. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. We couldn't even stump him with a winter drink right before we let him off. So <laughs> uh, definitely check out all the links. We did drop those in the comments section for everybody who is uh, wondering where you can find his work, where you can find the rest of his workshops, definitely support our speakers. They do this for you guys so that makes the entire industry a better place. We want more good work out there. So huge thank you to Jordan Cocktail Camera once again, everybody with the team over there. And uh, look, that's all we got for you today. It's end of the day here, so it might be time for a cocktail ourselves. But uh, Jordan, huge thank you to you again. We hope to see you again on the channel. But that's all we got for you now. Another rendition of the BH Virtual Event Space in the books. Catch y'all next time. Sweet. Thanks, everybody.